let us get started then. So today's stream is uh, dedicated to router 7. Um, maybe I'll do something else as well in the end. Um, we'll see. We'll see how it goes, how I feel. But uh, first and foremost, we're going to tackle a couple of router 7 improvements. Now, router 7, for those of you who are not familiar, is an implementation of a small home internet router. So it's the little box that sits between your computer and your internet service provider. Uh, and this particular implementation is implemented entirely in Go. Um, and it's running on, let me actually pull the um, GitHub repository up as well. Um, we have a couple of pictures, though I think, yeah, they might be uh, on the installation subsection of our website. So here you can see the physical hardware on which it is running. You can see that I have an uplink network interface and a local area network LAN network interface, also a serial port, um, and the device itself is a, a PC Engine's APU, which is just a small embedded PC, but any embedded PC would do. Um, but I like this one, it's, it's high quality. So um, why did I end up implementing my own uh, small home internet router in Go? Well, I was using the Turris Omnia router before, which is a really nice router. Uh, it's open hardware, it's open source software, they have uh, automated updates. Um, everything was very promising, like it seemed to do everything that I wanted. But um, in May 2018, there was an automated update that pulled in a new version of ODHCP6C, which is a complicated name for the DHCP version 6 client that comes with OpenWRT. And that version didn't work so well with the DHCP servers of my ISP. Um, now, certainly the DHCP servers of my ISP could be a little bit more lenient, but at the same time, so could the DHCP version 6 client. Um, and I had actually contacted the author back then and uh, they were not very receptive to my suggestions for improvements. So I figured uh, it was a lot of fun and very interesting to develop my own router um, and it was actually quicker in the end than waiting for the issue to get fixed on either side. Um, so that's sort of the, the origin story. Um, and in doing so, I wanted to actually explore a couple of goals um, with like a lot of focus that I didn't see in other routers, in other open source routers at the time. So for example, in OpenWRT, you wouldn't have these easily available. Um, let's walk through a couple of them and you'll quickly sense a theme. So the first and foremost goal is to maximize internet connectivity. And that's also the subject of today's stream, actually. Um, a couple of examples I have here are um, when the DHCP configuration changes, um, or even if you just restart your router, some routers actually lose the most recent DHCP lease um, because they don't persist it to any permanent storage. And um, that's not the only reason why a DHCP configuration could expire, so to say, or no longer be available. Um, the other one is that your lease expires and you can't reach the DHCP server in time before your lease expires to renew the lease. Uh, whenever that happens, it could be that you're going to face an outage no matter what. But it could also be that if you just kept on, if you just held on to your IP address, you kept the IP address on the interface, it might still work for just long enough that by the time um, th that, you know, you have enough time to reach a DHCP server. And by the time you do that, the user will not even realize that there might have been the situation for uh, the potential for an outage. Um, that is, that is one bit. Um, the other bit is um, not only do I want to maximize internet connectivity in terms of what happens at runtime, I also, before actually runtime happens, like at test, compilation, build time, whatever you want to call it, um, I want to have unit and integration tests that use as close a setup to my production setup or to my actual internet connection um, as they can. So in this case, they use 507 packet capture files um, to actually minimize the chance that a software change on my end breaks my con connectivity, as had happened with the OpenWRT um, that I got from the Tories Omnia. Also, um, I want to have my updates be safe and quick. So if um, I had introduced the same bug that the OpenWRT had introduced back then, 
my current router wouldn't even update to that new version. Like it would detect before starting the update that everything is in order and that all of the connectivity works. It would then do the update, but the connectivity wouldn't be fully restored. Um, and at that point, it says, well, it looks like the new update is faulty, so it would roll back to the previous version. Um, and then I would need to manually get this process unstuck, right? Because every time it updates, it would go unhealthy and then roll back the update automatically. Now, uh, it sounds like that might be annoying, but keep in mind that uh, thanks to using KXEC, we can skip most of the reboot time and an update, even though we're rebooting into a new kernel version, translates into only 13 seconds of internet connectivity loss. Um, so it's not actually too bad. And then lastly, the last big theme is easy debugging. Um, so you can see everything here is about availability, right? I don't want to introduce mistakes. I want to, whenever mistakes happen, I want to still be online. Um, I want to safeguard the process to minimize mistakes as much as possible. And when they inevitably still happen, it should at least be easy to debug them. And that's the last point here. Um, and for this, I have all of the configuration related network packets uh, kept in a ring buffer, which you can then stream into Wireshark. And um, I'm going to talk about the outage that motivated today's stream in just a second. And there I also used the same technique to actually look into what had happened in the couple of minutes before I became aware of the problem. So this is sort of a retroactive debugging, as I like to call it here. It's like traveling back in time within limits, of course. Um, if I do an update of my router every day, then of course I can't travel back further than you know, uh, the last reboot. I, in theory, I could probably persist them on disk, but currently it's an in-memory ring buffer and it works well. Um, then we have the diagnostics daemon, um, which is um, what also the um, save and quick updates mechanism hooks into. The diagnostics daemon not only presents for humans what the current status of the internet connection is, uh, it can also provide this in a machine readable format. Um, and we're going to use this in one of the improvements that we're going to make today in the stream. And then lastly, all of the state of the system is stored as human readable JSON within the slash perm partition and it can be modified. So it's very easy to just fire up your editor um, and look at what the state is and potentially just fix the state by hand. For example, if you had like, I don't know, a typo in the host name of a DHCP lease or an IP address was uh, incorrectly um, handed out via DHCP and you wanted to correct it, then you could do so by just stopping the software, editing the file, restarting the software, and there you go. All right, um, so this is like the, the general introduction to the project. Um, I hope this gave like a quick overview for everybody who, who isn't familiar yet with the project. Um, in a nutshell, as I mentioned earlier, um, for those who have just now tuned in, it's a small home internet router um, and we're gonna make it a little bit more reliable. It's all implemented in Go. Um, so that's what we're going to be working with today. If you have any questions at any time, just let me know in the chat um, and I'll try to get to you um, as soon as I can. So um, one little issue that I wanted to fix mostly to sort of get into the mood of, of uh, working on the project and to demonstrate what it is that uh, we'll need to do if we want to do changes, uh, there is a little change here for the DNS forwarder where uh, currently it only listens on port UDP 53, um, but it should probably also listen on TCP 53. And I became aware of this issue by uh, going to the 2020 DNS Flag Day website, which was, well, scheduled for, oh, it hasn't even happened yet. Okay, cool. So um, it's scheduled for October 1st. And uh, what they want to do is they are suggesting that DNS servers will as a minimum save packet size use 1232, which is a little under the 1280 minimum MTU size that every link uh, in Ethernet needs to guarantee. So this should result in no fragmentation. Um, certainly a good idea to change this. Um, and they're also saying, um, and this is summarized in their FAQ, um, that DNS must work over TCP. Um, so DNS over UDP will still be the, the typical thing that clients will do, but in some cases it might be that you need to use DC, uh, DNS over TCP. Now, oddly enough, uh, I did run the test on my connection, but it did pass. No, we can we can do another we can do another run here. Yeah, it says all okay. 
Um, but when I actually do the test on the command line, and I can show you here, um, excuse me, there we go, let's open this up. Yeah, um, you can see that as soon as I specify the plus TCP option in this dig call, um, I get a connection refused error message. And this is because, you know, the DNS daemon in router 7 just does not listen on UDP, uh, sorry, on TCP 53. It only listens on UDP 53. So uh, this is the thing that we want to change. It should be an easy enough fix because we already have this concept of a multi-listener. Um, because we already have multiple IP addresses on which we need to listen, but we don't want to listen on all of the IP addresses. You know, given that this is a router, it has uh, an interface that's facing the internet and it has an interface that's facing the local network. And the DNS forwarding functionality, we only want to make available to the local network and not also to the internet. Um, so this is why we already have this logic. So um, let's actually open this up. There we go. So let me uh, open this up fully. This is um, the relevant code. We have an update listeners function here. Let me illustrate where this is called. So in the plumbing, um, where we start up uh, and you know, set everything up, like all of the different HTTP handlers um, and the, the, the actual DNS handlers themselves, um, we first configure the listeners once. And then whenever we get a sick user one Unix signal, we update the listeners again and also reread the leases file in case it has changed. Uh, this is sort of a very simple you know, change mechanism. Um, in other systems, you might be using more elaborate systems to, to do notifications across different processes, uh, such as Dbus maybe, um, or there are, I think it was called Ubus or something, like a smaller version of this. Um, but in router 7, we're only using Unix signals so far, and it has worked well for us so far because we really haven't needed a lot of you know, fancy functionality here. There's not a lot of integration happening. The system is kept minimal intentionally, um, so it can stay simple. And it does um, so far, I think. <laughs> All right. So um, here is the code in question. We have a, a dns.server. We have a listener adapter uh, that turns it into a multi-listener listener, which as you can see at the very bottom is an interface containing the listen and serve method and the close method. Now, um, I think what we want to do is just, yeah, I don't think we have a test for this right now. So I think uh, we're going to try and test this manually by just running the command maybe. Um, and then trying and see if we can resolve against localhost. So let's first let's first figure out if we can run a local test. So go install works. If we do dnsd-help, oh, let's see. Okay. Oh, it wants the interfaces uh, JSON file. So it might be hard to run it locally. But um, hmm. Let's see, maybe it's not so bad to just create an empty interfaces. And in fact, we might already have some code for this somewhere. Um, I actually thought, yeah, I already have a slash burn directory on this machine. Um, oh, but it doesn't contain interfaces because I've only used it for uh, testing go crazy programs and not for testing router seven yet. Okay, um, so let's see. This is what we have in our um, golden variable in our test. Um, we should be able to just modify this relatively easily. Let me see, we have a couple of helper functions that actually use the interfaces. Um, I think this one here, yeah. This one reads the interfaces.json. Um, and returns the IP address. So what the logic here is doing is uh, it's looking up the LAN zero interface and uh, obtaining the IP address and then it's saying it wants to listen on that. Um, so that's like the canonical address of this um, DNS forwarder. And then here in the update listeners, let's see what it's doing. Um, it's using the private interface address, but that does not come from the interfaces.json. This comes from the system. And then we don't actually 
Well, let's see. Oh yeah. Oh, so this is um, what will this return? Oh, uh, only if this works out. Okay, so if we have a DHCP v6 lease, then um, it'll also listen on the colon colon one address of the local delegated network. And then lastly, we have the HTTP debug handle listener um, also only on the um, private interface address, which is here hosts. Um, it might be good to rename hosts to private address. All right. Um, okay, we can we can uh, commit this later, but I figured while we're talking about it and while I'm, you know, while I'm discovering that the terminology is not as clear, um, why not get it out of the way? All right. Um, so then the, that means that the only place that we, the only thing that we need to have is a LAN zero and a corresponding IP address for it. Um, I think that should be fairly simple, but uh, due to file permissions, uh, let me just quickly do this in a separate terminal window, which you cannot see. All right, and here we are. So now we have an interfaces.json and it is um, owned by the correct user. All right, so hey, hello, <laughs> party of two. Um, cool. So we're working on router seven, um, which is a small home internet router like the, the little box between you and your ISP. Um, and currently I'm trying to get the DNS forwarder working on my local machine, like not on the router itself, um, so that we can make a small change and test it out. And then, you know, hopefully you'll have a feel for the project at least a little bit. So let's go to the interfaces.json. Figured we might as well just open this up from Emacs directly. Um, why copy and paste? So let's see, this needs to be Valid JSON, so I think, yeah, all of the trailing commas need to go. A little bit annoying, but that's what it is. And then let me just put in my correct IP address, and maybe this already works. Um, yeah, nice. All right. Um, is the whole thing in Go or one program in a Linux based router? Um, private and public WireGuard keys were shown. Nope, those are test-only keys, but thank you. Um, the whole thing is in Go, yes. Um, but, of course, it's using the Linux kernel underneath. So you could as well call it a Linux-based router, for sure. Um, however, the entire control plane is in Go. So there is there is not like a typical Linux system. There's not like a Linux user land. There's no GNU utilities. Um, there's no you know C library. There's no user land like that. Um, no traditional init system or anything like that. Everything is in Go. All right, um, cool. So um, let's see, dig. We're gonna dig on my local IP address. That doesn't quite work. Oh, it might not work because I actually lack permission to, yeah, permission denied to listen on the, all of these IP addresses. Let's add some more sudo. And there we go. Um, so now if we do plus TCP, yeah, we get connection refused. Um, so now it should be very simple to just add the new listener and verify that it works. So we want to go into update listeners, uncomment this, hosts has been renamed to private address, compile this again, hey ho. Okay, connection refused, fine, because we're still using UDP here. Connection fused still. Okay, um, so why is that? Um, net TCP, that, that should be correct, no? We have two instances here. Okay, so let's make this a little bit um,
clearer what's happening here. Let's see. Okay, so this is uh, oh, this is in the multi-listener pool. Okay, cool. So it says now listening on. Oh yeah, and I think host uh, it's put into a map, which is why we can't currently have. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I think though. Then I wonder like oh because this is a separate pool. It's HTTP listeners. Okay. Oh yeah, so one thing we could do trivially is um, instead of DNS listeners, we make DNS UDP listeners and DNS TCP listeners. And maybe that just circumvents the entire problem. So let's see, let's give it a shot. Oh yeah, nice, there we go. Um, okay, flag day is safe. Uh, it can now <laughs> turn October 1st and I'll be ready. Cool. Um, so let's, let's actually stage all of these different changes. Um, yeah, at this point we should have, uh, we should have committed them separately, but Hey, um, let's not spend too much time on this. Actually, let me do it like this. Okay, cool. Um, DNS the listen on TCP 5.3. DNS must work over TCP. Fixes issue 59. Um. All right. That should be that. Uh, let's double check. Cool, looks good. Push it to upstream. There we go. And it is marked closed. Nice. All right, um, any questions so far? Or um, is it now a little bit more clear? Um, so what we've just done is uh, we've changed one part of router seven. Um, let me pull up the architecture page. There are a couple of state files. There are a couple of available ports. The port that we just changed is port 53, which is the DNS forwarder. Um, let's see. Yeah, the page doesn't mention anything more about it, but it's conceptually also fairly simple because uh, its only job is to forward DNS queries to the upstream DNS resolver. It doesn't even have a local cache. It just always ever forwards. Um, and the, the main reason why we need it at all and don't just hand out public resolvers is because it has the concept of uh, local machines in the local network. So it collaborates with the DHCP4 server so that it can actually provide name resolution for local addresses. So if I just want to say ping laptop and from the laptop, I want to say ping desktop, then I can do that if that's if those are the names of my computers. Um, and that's because of the DNS server component here. So that means that all of our traffic goes through this DNS server, which means um, I wanted it to be ready for the DNS flag day 2020, where it says that DNS must work over TCP. So this is what we just implemented. Um, let me show you the commit real quick. Um, aside from the private address change, excuse me, where we changed the uh, variable name to be more descriptive, um, this was the only change. We introduced a new multi-listen pool because uh, the host of the private addresses is actually a unique key in the map, so we couldn't reuse the same pool. But then uh, we used the same concept as here, exactly the same, except UDP versus TCP. Um, so now we have UDP and TCP listeners and we serve DNS on both of them. Cool, um, so once I update my router um, the next time, either manually or automatically next Monday, um, this change will be included um, and then I will have uh, DNS available via TCP as well. All right, so let's actually dive into what we wanted to do today, right? Um, so I mentioned a couple of times that there was a recent outage, uh, let's pull it up. Um, so this is the status page um, of the ISP that I'm currently with. They said that the duration of the outage was from 1613 to 1640. Um, severity, one to five, presumably, you know, five is worse, I guess, it's a four. Um, 
it was a brief outage of the DHCP v4 servers. Um, and the way I noticed this was that shortly before 1640 or shortly after, uh, a friend of mine contacted me and asked me whether my internet connection was still working because his seemed to have a problem. Um, and at the time I said, yeah, mine still seems to be up and then it went down. Um, so <laughs> it was a very timely message. Um, and But notably that was after the, the internet service provider actually declared the outage to be over, right? So what was really happening there? Um, and the problem was not just that um, the DHCP server was not available. The other problem was that, um, so, okay, so there were two problems here, right? Um, one problem was, and that's this issue here, um, there are two ways you can ask for an IP address in DHCP. The first way is if you start from scratch, you're just gonna send a DHCP discover, the other side makes you an offer, and then you request that address. The other way, if you already have an address, is you immediately send a request for that address. And then the other side says, oh yeah, that address is still valid. Yes, you still can use it. Please just go ahead. So what had happened in this outage is that even after the ISP declared the outage to be over, the DHCP server would tell me upon my requests that it was okay for me to reuse the IP address, when in reality it wasn't and I couldn't send any traffic out to the internet anymore um, because of a feature that my ISP uses, which is called port security. Um, and in port security, essentially, your MAC address will only be whitelisted as soon as there is a valid DHCP lease in the system for it. Um, so it's like you know the, the access switches collaborate with the DHCP server, so to say, and both must be in sync. So you have an interest in having a valid DHCP lease, um, otherwise you can't send any traffic out, right? So kind of kind of vital to the whole internet router uh, thing. So um, the router was telling me that the IP address was still okay when it really wasn't. And um, we're gonna talk about this in a little bit to make it so that the DHCP program will actually start over and you know start from scratch so that we really can obtain a new IP address. But once I instructed my DHCP program to get a new IP address, it did that and then some things started working, but not everything still, because there was a second problem here, which is that when you get a new IP address, uh, the currently router seven will not deconfigure the old IP address, but rather you will end up having two public IP addresses on the same uplink interface. Uh, you can see Linux marks one of them as secondary. Unfortunately, the one it marked as secondary is the IP address that I must use to get traffic out. Um, and the one that it had marked as primary or you know non-secondary, whatever that means in Linux, um, is the one that was no longer valid. So ideally, we should actually remove the IP addresses uh, in the DHCP4 program. Some might say immediately once they're no longer valid, but I mentioned earlier that one of the project goals is to maximize internet connectivity. And we can't know at that point whether the IP address is either going to cause trouble later because we might get the same IP address and then everything works fine, or um, whether the IP address will actually uh, keep working um, and by not deconfiguring it, we actually prevent the outage. So like either way is, is kind of possible, right? It's hard to know which one's which. So I think the best choice is that um, the program should remember which IP addresses it configures. And then once it knows for sure which one the desired IP address is, it should deconfigure all old ones and then only configure the new one. And that way we get sort of the maximization of internet connectivity. And we also get the uh, deconfigure all the old IP addresses when you get a new one. And uh, the only reason why this isn't already done is because apparently ever since I started the project, I had the same public IP address um, because the ISP is so stable. So that's kind of cool. But at the same time, it also means that I don't exercise these failure paths. So here we are, um, and I needed to like you know have I, I needed to manually change something in my router to restore internet connectivity, or just do a power reset. But um, it, it is my goal that the router can auto recover, and you never need to do a reset, or you never need to do manual intervention because maybe I'm not home, um, you know, unlikely currently, but maybe in the future, um, if I'm not home, I would like it if my internet connectivity would magically restore itself. Um, and not wait for me to come back from vacation, for example. All right, um, so I hope this gives you like a rough idea of what the problem was. Um, otherwise, let me know. 
Um, so now we're going to take a look um, because I actually can't remember. It's been many years since I started the project. So I figured I'd not prepare too much for the stream, just a little bit. Um, so my work environment all works, but um, I haven't actually gotten up to speed on like the project code. So I don't know myself which changes precisely we need to make. And I think that makes it a little bit more interesting for you as well, because you can see how I sort of deduce that and get back into and like reestablish all the state. Um, so hopefully that helps. Otherwise, feel free to tune out the unimportant parts. All right, um, so let's see. Let's navigate to the DHCP4 program. I think we have multiple tests for it. Um, the structure always is um, we have a command directory. That's this one here. In command, there is one subdirectory for every daemon that we have on the system. DHCP4 is the daemon we're interested in. And then we have an internal directory in which we have sort of a shadow hierarchy. So for every command that is in command, um, we also have a corresponding directory in internal and that's where the implementation lives. And that's also where the implementation test lives. So this is the unit test for DHCP4. And then we have a separate integration uh, testing directory where we have a DHCP v4 integration test. So my hope is that in one of these tests, we actually verify which IP addresses are set on an interface. And then we can just extend that test um, and like simulate the outage within the test, change the behavior so that it is better. And then we have added the test, like it would be test-driven development. Um, so that's the, that's the goal. All right, um, so let's see, test DHCP v4. Um, are there any other test functions? No, there's a test error, fair enough. And then this one here, um, what's it say? Oh, this is, oh, this is DHCP v4, but uh, this tests our server. So I think, yeah, in net config, we might, let's see. Okay, so here you can see a couple of IP link add and set commands. That is a good sign. Um, there's an IP address here. So this is where it verifies that um, on uplink null, it sets uplink zero, it sets the IP address. Um, and let's see, where does it actually, oh, this is where it re-executes itself. Okay, cool. Um, then we have WireGuard verification. Okay, cool. Oh, and it only does that based on the uh, golden interfaces file here and the um, golden DHCP4 file. So this is the client IP and it configures that. Um, and then currently on the interface, okay, so if we now were to like apply two different sets of configs, then I would expect that um, we should see both of these IP addresses on the interface. So why don't we go ahead and change the test to just that. Okay, I'm trying to, to see which bits exactly we wanna copy as the basis for our new test. I think we're just gonna use testnet config up until verify addresses. Just gonna append that at the very end of our test file. So let's see, this is um, test DHCP v4 old address deconfigured. You can always rename it later if you find a better name, but this should be fine. So we only need, don't need the port forwardings, we only need the interfaces and the uh, DHCP4 lease. Also no wire guard. We don't need to prepare any uh, NF tables rules. I don't think we need the resolve conf either. We'll see. So then it adds the network namespace. This should be NS4, I assume. Oh no, we already have NS4. NS5. Yeah, that should be fine. Um, it's better if they're unique so that, you know, no matter which tests get executed in parallel together, um, it never clashes. All right. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. So this is the reaxic helper. And then test verify addresses is all we want. We don't need any of the routes. Oh, actually we should verify the routes um, because currently I think I also had to remove an old route. So the old default route needs to be replaced properly as well. Okay, so we don't need this one here. We only need the uplink. And we don't need the IPv6 address either because we're only looking at IPv4. So, cool. Okay, so this is already a lot shorter. It's not super short, but you know, gotta start somewhere. Cool, um, what's this say? Okay. Is this, did I change this at all? No, I did not. Um, so I'm a little bit surprised what it's saying here. But let's see if make test helps in any way. Can also uh, start this out of Emacs which I'll probably switch to, but, okay, so this works. I was just wondering, like, oh, um, also, the, yeah, um, okay, never mind. So we have to do it like this, actually. Okay, so what I was trying to do is I was trying to run the test directly, um, test DHCP before old address deconfigured. Um, but when I do this, it just runs go test and that won't work because it doesn't have the correct permissions anyway. So we need to go via make test anyway. Um, so we might as well get in the habit. So what's it say? Um, X is status one. Um, hopefully there's also an error somewhere actually. This is test not config. No, there's doesn't seem to be any error. Okay, um, let's see. Five four eight. Oh, okay. Because it doesn't have uplink zero, maybe. I don't know. What can we do here? Um, all right. So, I think we're also gonna temporarily do is uh, in make test. We can skip these and we're gonna say right. integration at config. Um, so what's it say? All right, cool. So now we have the error message device uplink zero does not exist. Fair enough, but why not? Oh, because we only have dummy zero and LAN zero. Where does uplink zero come from in the other test then? Oh, it is, is it added? Oh, it is renamed from, from dummy zero, I think. Yeah, that is the address of dummy zero. So let's see. I mean, we should be using the same golden file, I think. Yeah, golden interfaces is here. So actually, I think I might have done a mistake copying here. Yeah, ha, <laughs> right. Accidentally removed too much code. So this is why nothing was happening. Um, 
we do need the netconfig.apply call. Otherwise, no netconfig is going to be applied. Uh, fairly self-explanatory. Um, and now the test passes. Okay, so far so good. Now, what we want to do is um, instead of golden DHCP4, I have our own literal and we're just going to override it. Golden file name will be the list of JSON path. And golden content Let's just call it another DXCP form. Cool. So in here, I'm going to use 99 as the IP address and also change the subnet so that we've got a default gateway that is different um, and that will mean also different route. All right. Oh, okay. Um, and then, you know, same mistake as before, actually also applied. So now it fails. Oh, um, oh, <laughs> 299, not a valid IP address. Turns out they end at 254, 254. Um, all right, so this is this is what I was expecting, right? Um, we now have, so this is complaining about the routes. Let me see. Okay, yeah, we have an additional route, the 199.0, uh, because of the link source here. Oh, and that also implicitly verifies the IP address. That's kind of neat. So let me see, how do we want to change this? Um, I think we actually want to verify that this regular expression does not actually match. And we want 199.99 uh, broadcast, probably the same. This should match, um, actually. If this matches, expectedly still matches. Quite cool. Okay. Um, Yeah, so this is the address output. This is exactly what I was expecting. We now have both IP addresses on the interface. Certainly not great. Um, now the question is, how do we approach this, right? So now we have the test case to the point that I wanted to have it, right? It now actually does two um, configurations and it verifies the config and it already fails. So now we need to make it pass and then uh, this issue should be done. Um, but how can we do this? Um, so I mentioned earlier that all of the IP addresses which the DHCP client applies, um, we should remove once we have a new one that overrides it. However, uh, the client doesn't keep that state. So the DHCP server just writes its lease into a file and then the netconfig, which is the thing that we're currently modifying and testing, is uh, what actually reads the file, determines the desired network interface configuration state and applies that. So that is the place where we need to um, configure and deconfigure the old IP addresses. And one obvious way that we could do is we could just say, well, we're going to query all of the IP addresses of the interface that um, are currently on the interfaces, and we're just going to remove all of the ones that we no longer want. Um, but then that also means that a user can never configure an additional IP address onto the interface without having that config uh, remove that, right? Which currently might be an opportunity or a, a possibility. But thinking about it, I don't think that's necessarily a problem if that no longer works, um, because it's easy enough to just modify the, the interface's state and then netconfig picks it up. And you probably want netconfig to be in charge of at least the uplink zero interface. Um, it should probably not 
deconfigure other IP addresses on other interfaces. Like if you added, say, a WireGuard interface yourself, that should be kept untouched. But I think an interface that you explicitly specify should be managed by netconfig. It's fair game to say, we're just going to remove all of the IP addresses that we no longer think should be there. Um, so let's go into internal netconfig, netconfig, which is the implementation. Um, we have an apply interfaces here. Uh, we have a link set up. We have a link set name, link set hardware address, and then we have an address replace. Yeah, um, and that is the one I think that we'll need to change. Replacing address. Yeah, I, I guess we're just gonna print these, see what happens. Yeah, all right. So, what's it saying? Um, it's gonna replace this address. Really? Um, what I'm looking for is the public IP addresses, but they don't seem to be in here. Oh, probably because this is actually apply interfaces is distinct from apply DHCP4. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Cool. Um, so address link, all right, cool. I'll run it again and see what happens. Okay, yeah, that's the IP address I was looking for. Um, so, all right, so this is this is what we have right now. Um, we have a netlink handle we call address replace. And, you know, the semantics apparently, well, let's see what these semantics are. IP adder mon page. Huh. Okay. Um. Oh, because it's IP address. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, okay, then we can view it here. Okay, so we have, there is add, change, and replace. So let's see what the semantics of replace actually are. Well, it doesn't tell us, that's great. Um, nothing address replace semantics because apparently it doesn't mean that the other addresses oh i think this is what we are looking for replace existing matching config object with this request so if we change anything like you know the um the net mask or the the broad broadcast address uh, for this ip address then we don't need to like remove it first and then re-add it we can just change its configuration but replacing things only means replacing them for this IP address if it's already configured. So that's why this is not enough. And in addition to replacing the address on the interface, we also actually want to get the existing addresses and then deconfigure any extra ones that we don't recognize. So um, obtain current IP addresses from link and deconfigure any addresses that we do not recognize. Cool. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions at all, uh, let me know in the chat at any time. I'm happy to uh, take a question. Okay, so let me see. Let's open up the Netlink packages documentation here. We have add or replace. I think there should be something like get adder, maybe list adder. Mm -hmm. Where could it be? Okay, um, add a list, I think this is what we want. But can we also call it on a handle?
Oh yeah, there it is, adder list, cool. It gets a list of IP addresses in the system equivalent to IP adder show, but for this particular link. All right, yeah, I think that is what we want. So adder list link. Oh, and then family is some sort of constant meaning IPv4, but um, I don't know what it's called off the top of my head. So let's see, we have constants. Is there a family one? Hmm. Oh yeah, there we go. So in this case, we only want IPv4 because we're dealing with DHCP v4, so it shouldn't touch any v6 addresses. So here, oops, um, sorry, I saved too early. Um, we also want to add enough detail into this error message too. Okay, and then just print this and see how far we come. All right, this looks good. So now we see that we have two IP addresses here. Um, Let's see. All right, because we only have one client IP address, this is actually fairly simple. So we only need to check, this is probably address string, I guess. Let's see, what type is adder? Um, adder list, adder. Oh, it embeds the net IP net, okay. Right. So if we just say string, I think I know what it's going to be, but let's verify. It's always good to verify and then document. See, because this is actually a little bit different than what I expected. All right, so we need to be uh, IP net dot string. We need to be more specific here. Cool, so this is what I wanted. Uh, so, cool. And then, oh. So if this is, Wait, client IP slash seven size, okay. Jeez. Sorry, I'm too quick with my save button or too sloppy with my source code, whichever way you want to look at it. Got adder. Then we continue because then is legit. And then here we say deconfigure this IP net. All right, let's see what this does. Yeah, um, I would say this actually looks exactly right. So the next step, I bet there is a um, adder del. It's probably also defined on the handle. Yeah, there we go. Oops, sorry. Um, so it needs a link, an adder, oh, oh, but I think we can just give it this one, no, maybe. Link adder error. Or we cannot. Why? Pointer versus non pointer. All right. Okay. 
So what's it say? Um, default, different, good. This, this all looks very good actually. Um, also, there's no longer any messages about a regular expression not matching. So, deconfiguring old IP address. Just so that we know what's going on if um, we're looking into debug logs. All right. Oh yeah, but we just, we shouldn't put a link in there like so. It doesn't have like, um, oh, that's, that is annoying. It doesn't have like an easy uh, string method. That's probably why I why I didn't have it in there previously. But maybe we can actually. Oh, it's always uplink zero. Okay. Cool. So just gonna use link name in the error messages. Nice. Okay, so now let's just the golden here. Um, default should be 199 with uh, All right. Nice. Uh, let's change make file back to how it was previously run all of the tests now, see if we broke anything else accidentally. Looks good, all right, um, very nice. So this is the change. Let's go through it again from the, from the start. So uh, we changed uplink zero for the error messages. Uh, we extracted the client IP address into a variable for later comparison. We listed all of the existing IP addresses. Uh, the one that we expect, we skip, and anything else we deconfigure from the interface. That's the code change, and then we have a test change. Um, and in here, we can actually remove this, which we did not need after all, as we expected. Yeah. Um, perfect. So. This is issue five seven. Fixes issue five seven. Net config deconfigure old DHCP v four addresses from opening zero. Um, Let's just uh, add a quick summary in here for people who only read the commit message for whichever reason, maybe in the blame layer or something like this, um, and they don't necessarily click through to the bug. So it's good to like summarize the most important bits into the commit message as well. So it is generally not a good idea to have multiple IP addresses on the same interface um, unless managing their metrics, etc. During an outage, I noticed that with multiple IP addresses, Linux was using the old obsolete one to send out packets, which does not work with the ISP. Okay. With this change, we still hold on to IP addresses for as long as possible, but no longer. And that is the new bit. Okay. Um, to have multiple IP address. There are priorities. Right. Oh, obviously, we want to send our packets. 
which doesn't work with the ISP. Okay, um, added some semantic new lines, which I like. Uh, generally not a good idea. Yeah, this should be fine. Cool. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Pretty upstream. Why not delete them first, then add the new one? Well, because then you don't have an IP address in a brief period of time, and that's really not great for outgoing packets. Um, what we are adding is either the same IP address, but then we're replacing it so that doesn't fail, or we're adding a new one, and that also doesn't fail, and then we remove the old ones afterwards. It's important to always have an IP address. Um, just to, to illustrate what we were talking about, this is the code, right? So we're adding the new IP address first, then we're listing and removing any obsolete ones. Uh, I think it's better to do it in this order. All right, um, let's see. This one should be marked closed, but wasn't um, because for some reason the syntax doesn't work. Probably the issue is too much and should just be fixes number five, seven. It's better to have a wrong one than none at all. Yes, um, I think so. Because yeah, um, the the wrong one might not be so wrong after all. It might just be expired, but still working. Okay, um, so I'm gonna close this manually here um, because this is now fixed. All right, and then we have this next issue where um, we might be doing a little bit more of, a, of an integration here, um, a little bit more design work. Um, but yeah, one step after the other. So um, the issue title is automatic release and start over upon unhealthiness. So I mentioned earlier that um, we have what's called the diagnostics daemon, diag D. And um, what it does is um, essentially it has this flowchart where uh, it does various things, and if they work, then it does some more things. So for example, it looks whether you have an uplink zero interface, and if so, then it checks whether it has a DHCP v4 lease, and if so, it pings the IPv4 gateway, and if so, it pings google.ch, and if that also works, it establishes a TCP4 connection to google.ch port 80. Um, so that's sort of the diagnostics uh, flowchart for IPv6, uh, sorry, IPv4 connectivity issues. Um, so you would first, you know, check that you have a lease, check that you can ping the gateway, check that you can ping anything, and then actually establish a connection. For all of the others, it's the same principle. It checks that uh, we have a DHCP v4 lease that's still valid. Uh, check that uh, a ping from LAN0 um, to google.ch actually works. Um, and for router advertisements, which is the other big part of how IPv6 is coming to me, um, it checks that it has a router advertisement, checks that it can ping the gateway, checks that it can ping google.ch via IPv6, and then establish a connection. Uh, it also pings the all routers um, IP address, which is like a special um, multicast IP address, um, just so that it is in the diagnostics output. I guess you have to do that because you can't change the config in an atomic way. Um, yeah, I think so. I think there's no atomicity in netlink the way we currently use it via that netlink package it might be that you can actually do batches if you like went a little lower level maybe um but yeah no big deal all right um so okay and and the uh, diag d also so this flow graph not only does it render it as html but it also provides it as a slash health.json where if any of these steps fails, uh, the system is considered unhealthy and it sets the first error message in here. Um, and if first error is not set, then um, the system is healthy. So this is what you can use to figure out um, if there is a problem. So let's actually, let's actually look at this in practice. Um, the listening port for DIAG-D is 7733. So one thing we can do is call uh, diagd.router7, oh, I, actually, we don't even need that. Uh, help.json, we don't even need the port. Okay, um, we don't even need the port because, there we go. Um, 
I have this uh, DNS integration where all of the services that are running on Go Crazy get their own DNS subdomain. Um, so I don't even need to specify the port, which is kind of neat. Like um, I like identifying processes by name. Um, so I tend to use this usually when I type in something, um, but you know maybe you don't want to rely on that, uh, especially in, in components that should keep working even if different parts of the system fail. So maybe it's better to use the um, port number after all. Anyway, so the health.json handler, as you can see here, returns first error empty string, which means that uh, everything is currently healthy and I'm online, which is great because you can follow my stream. Um, you know, Otherwise, it would be kind of weird if that worked. Um, so we cannot actually test this um, if I want to keep streaming. Um, so fair enough, right? But um, now you see like how to query the diagd. Um, and currently, the um, DHCP4 program, which obtains the DHCP4 lease from my ISP, doesn't integrate at all into the healthiness status or not, in the sense that it doesn't know whether the system is healthy or not. So, like the this the functionality that the DHCP4 program has, like it gets you a lease, that totally factors into what DIACD does, right? Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is that DHCP4 itself doesn't know whether the system overall is healthy or not. Um, and in fact, you know, during much of its operation, it's very likely that the system is not overall healthy. But if the system stays unhealthy for a prolonged period of time, even though DHCP4 thinks everything is okay, it might be a good idea to just start over from scratch, um, just to be sure that the DHCP server that we're sending our requests to is still actually also going to offer us that lease if we were to start from scratch and ask anew. Um, and that should entirely sidestep the problem um, that I had, you know, why my link wouldn't wouldn't recover. So either we can say we always make our DHCP4 session start from scratch, but then I don't know if we wouldn't change IP address more often. I mean, I would assume that the DHCP server should give us in the in the DHCP offer that they sent, they should give us the same IP address that we already have. You know, but then you add another assumption and maybe it doesn't actually hold. So this whole issue is because the assumption didn't hold that if you request uh, an IP address, you're also allowed to use it. And even though the DHCP server said, yes, you are allowed to use it, I wasn't allowed to use it. So already we're dealing with a broken assumption. So it's not good to add more assumptions that can break in different ways to the fix for this one. Um, so that's why I wanted to add this additional safeguard, this additional recovery step, this additional like automated self-healing process, if you want to call it that. Um, you know, maybe almost too fancy for how simple a mechanism this is going to be. Okay, so let's look at the DHCP4 program. Um, this is the logic. Shouldn't be too much, I don't think. Yeah, it's just a, a screen full here. Um, so we have a whole bunch of of logic for constructing the DHCP4 client and configuring it. And then um, we have the actual loop where it runs. So we have this obtain or renew function, which, you know, as the name says, either it obtains if DHCP hasn't been started before or it renews the lease. Um, if it runs into an error, we're gonna um, get a back off duration. And then, you know, if it's a temporary error, if it runs into an error here, then it must be a temporary error. And then we do a back off and then continue. Um, whenever we actually get a response, we reset the back off. Otherwise this is gonna be exponential back off. Uh, you can see here it has a factor is two. Jitter is enabled so that uh, retries are spread out a little bit so as to not overwhelm the um, DHCP server of the ISP. And then um, when we get a lease, this is what happens. Um, we write the we write the lease file. So we write the actual DHCP ACK package to disk, and we write the lease file to disk as well. So the lease file is sort of our interpretation of what came over the wire. And then the acknowledgement packet is literally the bytes of what came over the wire. So if you wanted to debug this, or if you wanted to change it, um, you totally could. Um, and then that way you can influence the, the DHCP server. Um, and then either we're going to sleep until the um, renew time has arrived or until we receive a sick user two, 
which is the um, magic code for release your lease um, and exit and don't start up again. So this is like, you know, if, if you were to, um, if you were to change router, if you were to go from router seven to, let's say back to the Taurus Omnia, uh, it would be best for the whole like DHCP lifecycle. And in order to switch your internet connection uninterrupted, it would be best if you were to send SIG user to thereby release the DHCP lease, disconnect the old router from the interface and then connect a new router and then have it start from scratch with an entirely new um, DHCP cycle. Because if you change the MAC address, then that might help um, because the ISP only gives you one valid lease at a time for your link. Um, so otherwise you might need to wait for the old lease to expire. But if you, if you actively release it, then you don't need to wait for this. All right. Um, so this also sets C dot act to nil, but I don't think it actually um, deletes the acknowledgement file. So I think yeah, so it's totally gonna restore the act packet if you're gonna if you're gonna restart um, if you're gonna restart the process. So I think it would be good here actually to also say. Oh, I start remove act fun. And if, if it cannot be deleted, we at least want to report it and then we're going to exit anyway. But yeah. Ensure the ensure DHCP4 does start from scratch next time. And by deleting the DHCP app. All right. I can say this is related to fifty eight. I'm also going to run the tests before we push. I don't think this is actually exercised by the tests. I just want to make sure that I don't accidentally break something. All right, um, so now, what do we want? Um, most of the time, the program is going to be sitting in this uh, condition here. It's going to wait for the time to elapse to obtain a new lease or to, to renew its existing lease. Um, so we could add... Hmm, let's see. So I think in terms of granularity, if we did this, then we would interrupt the main select statement every minute. And in here, we could check um, if we're currently unhealthy. And if so, um, we could increase a counter and after like, let's say five minutes of continuous unhealthiness, um, we could say, okay, this, this looks suspicious. Um, you know, the DHCP program thinks everything is good, but the connection just doesn't get healthy. Um, maybe it should start over from scratch um, and, and, you know, yeah, drop its current lease, so to say. Um, so I think in terms of dropping, that would just be um, c.ac equals nil, and then just start over from scratch. Uh, because then, and by start over from scratch, I mean start another loop iteration, of course, right? Um, in the DHCP request, yeah, this is where the conditional is. So um, it, it sends a discover if c.ac is nil. So that's, that's why I'm setting it to nil. Um, but check if unhealthy, check if unhealthy for five continuous minutes. Um, and also so this now means that we have a new, uh, a new control flow here. Um, 
And I think what we want to do is we want to set a label here, obtain or renew, and then we want to specify continue obtain or renew so that it jumps to the outer loop. So we're going to introduce another inner loop. Um, and this one here should actually fall through and then continue, and then it's going to check again. So Okay, so this is where our code would go, I think. Um, and in terms of what we need to do is we just need to like over HTTP query the diagnostic steam program, obtain its help.json and verify whether uh, you know there's any error in the connection or not. Now in terms of testing, that's what we need to think about a little bit here. Um, how can we best test this? Problem is that we don't have um, a full integration test yet. We do have an integration test for the other end of this. So uh, for DHCP for server, but not for the DHCP for client. And um, yeah, in here, We do have a test, but it's only a relatively basic unit test. Um, and because it's not an integration test, it doesn't cover the code that we were looking at at all, um, because this is all sort of the, the main plumbing and logic. Um, and we don't have a test for this. So what we could try to do is introduce a test here um, or add an integration test, but that might be lengthy um, but adding a test here might be tedious <clears throat> it's just about to ask how do you usually test timeout functions if in passing in duration so they can be 10 as in prod but one milliseconds in the tests huh yes uh, it's a good question and timeouts are uh, a perpetual annoyance uh, when dealing with tests um, having timeouts one sec one millisecond in tests sounds like it might you know, depending on what it is that you're doing, this might still be flaky and or racy. Um, typically, it's good to use a fake clock um, and then advance it artificially um, and have it not advance crucially also while you don't want it to advance. Um, there is, I think, a Go package called Clockwork. Yeah, this is the one that I would recommend. Uh, you can either pass in a new real clock or a fake clock. Um, and then there's the clock interface, which takes either. And instead of using the time.after functions, etc., you would use the uh, clock interfaces functions. And then you could substitute it with a fake clock that you can advance um, as you want. There's an advance and a block until. Um, yeah, that's what I would generally recommend. Now, let's see again. So, I mean, the loop is simple enough, and I think I'm just going to test this later manually. Um, one thing that we can prepare, though, is um, we can just complete the code. It's not actually too hard. Um, we can at least add the, the healthy or unhealthy status. Just sort short circuit. Short, sorry, short circuit everything uh, like so, um, and just implement the healthy logic, um, and then wire that up with a counter. And then I'm going to leave the testing for later off stream, because I think that's going to be the most pragmatic and most simple. All right. Um, so I'm going to do HTTP dot get router seven 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 three three. Um, use the localhost. 
instead of router seven later um, because we don't want to rely on name resolution. Slash health.json. All right, and what we also want to do actually um, I thought that was it, maybe not. Okay, so what we want to do is have the URL here for context. Uh, we want to have the HTTP status, including its human readable description as what was received. And we want to have the want variable, which will just be status okay for what was desired. All right, um, so now that we have that, um, we can just do an IOUtil that read all on the response body. Oh, by the way, that's also a good tip in general. Um, the HTTP server will give you an error message in the body and it's typically good to include it in here um, because otherwise we'll just see something like, you know, you got an internal server error instead of 200 and then you will wonder, well, what exactly was the internal server error? Um, or you get a permission denied and you wonder, well, why, right? So it's always good to include this context here, um, unless it's actually a file response accidentally, right? Um, so in some other projects and contexts, I have like another check in there, um, if it's actually printable characters or not. Um, and I only print them if so. Um, I think actually like all of this sort of, you know, it's, there's a bunch of sharp edges and it would be nice to have like a, a more convenient interface for these sorts of HTTP tasks. Um, but I don't know if there's any work underway still on the new HTTP package or not. All right, so uh, if we can't read the body, we're just gonna error out. So let me see, dive D. Um, this is the variable. I'm just gonna do an anonymous type here. And we say json.unmarshal, the data is our body. And we unmarshal into the reply. Okay, and then we say, if reply the first error is not the empty string, we're gonna say errors.new reply the first error. And otherwise, we return nil, indicating that the system is healthy. Uh, yeah, let's run it. Says so healthy. Cool. All right, this is going to be localhost. So then, so if it says healthy, then we're just going to fall through and continue with the next check. Um, and otherwise we're gonna say, router unhealthy and we, we're gonna fall through. However, So 
we're going to increase this and we say if unhealthy cycles equals five or well if it's smaller than five it's going to continue unhealthy for longer fall through all right uh, drop dhcp lease and start from scratch Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, I think that should be most of it actually. Yeah, and then all that's left is some manual testing. Um, any questions for this or otherwise I'm gonna update this issue so that uh, the status is clear, already assigned to me. Um, I'm done, just need some manual testing round after my stream. All right, cool. Um, any questions up until here? Uh, let me know in the chat. Um, otherwise, there are still a couple of other open issues, um, but there was also one other thing that I wanted to work on. Let me just pull this up real quick. So GitHub, go and go issues, create eight one zero. All right, um, close this here. All right, cool. There we are. Okay, um, so I filed this issue a while ago, um, and I wasn't aware. Um, so maybe you aren't either, but um, on modern Linux systems, which are usually based on systemd, there is an API for user and group record lookup via bar link. This was introduced in systemd 245, which is relatively recent, uh, March 2020. So depending on you know where you fall on the uh, bleeding edge versus stable computer systems spectrum, um, either you have it or you know maybe eventually you'll get it. Um, this is actually pretty interesting for the OS slash user package where we currently integrate with uh, the name, name service switch only in environments where we have Seago. And in non Seago environments, we could still try querying systemd before we fall back on the current behavior of parsing Etsy password. Um, there are a couple of ways of doing this. Um, one of them is uh, user db ctl dash dash output equals JSON, but the problem is that um, then we are relying on an external process and you know maybe it's better for the standard library to not do that. Um, actually, it turns out that um, a proof of concept isn't too hard. Um, this is what I came up with. Um, yeah, as you can see, this is just, you know, JSON over a Unix socket with a, with a certain protocol over it. Um, not too complicated. And then um, this is just for the username, but let's see, oh yeah, uh, zero terminated JSON messages over Unix socket, that's what it is. Cool, um, so uh, Brad Fitz indicated that, you know, this should be pretty cool. So we might, we might give it a shot. Um, any questions before we jump in here or all set? All right, so let's um, scroll over the uh, user group record lookup API to refresh our memory. Um, yeah, so it, it reiterates here that, you know, typically the um, NSS mechanism is um, 
using shared libraries, um, to, you know, as a as a plugin interface in in C, which is not super convenient in languages that are not C. For example, you know, Go without C Go. Um, all right, and then they outline why varlink instead of dbus. Fair enough. We don't need to be concerned with it. We just want to know what the outcome is. So then we have a subsystem that offers interfaces as a Unix socket stream in run system D user DB. Let's just quickly make sure that everything is set up here. Yeah, we have this on our system. You know, sometimes features get removed or disabled after they're introduced. So I just wanted to, to verify early enough, you know, that this will actually be available. Okay, there's no order or programmatic expression language defining which queries are issued. Instead, all queries are always enqueued in parallel to all defined services. Okay, fair enough. First successful look of wins. Okay. There's a couple of well-known services, name service switch. Ah, right. And then io.systemd.multiplexer, which, uh, yeah, takes some of the work that we would otherwise need to do um, to talk to systemd user dbd. Oh yeah, and there's, there's also a couple of other services, but we don't care about these right now. Okay, so let's see the proof of concept that I had here. I was talking to the multiplexer and I was saying get user record, but maybe what we need to do instead is just call the name service switch service Um, I guess it's time to dive into the OS user code and see what it actually does. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's really all there is to it. We're gonna see if that's true. Um, scroll back up, compatibility with NSS. That's, I think, a good thing to leave on screen. Um, so we're gonna take my proof of concept here. Um, Say OS user okay go run OS user go right um IOS system the multiplexer no such file directory oh it only has IOS system dynamic user see um why did nobody correct me on this dynamic user is that even the same API yeah, this is a different one. This is uh, implemented by the service manager itself. So this is always available. Um, so the user DVD must not currently be running on my machine, I suppose. It is not. Oh, but there's a socket for it. Really? Oh, the socket is also not running. Why is that not enabled? That is strange. Um, let me try, let me try enabling this real quick. Uh, maybe this is one of the features that is not yet enabled by default. Okay, so now it's running. Um, oh yeah, there we go. Um, so now we queried uh, the smoke ping user on my machine. Oh, actually, also a couple of others um, which have scrolled by here, okay, SFTP only, etc. All right. Um, give me just a quick second. Sorry about that. Um, cool. So this is um, this is the system D variant. Uh, always a bit awkward with the spelling. When you're dealing with acronyms, 
uh, such as Seagull. Okay, um, so in here, I think even user.current is uh, one that requires Seagull. Okay, so this still works um, because I think it comes out of Etsy password directly. Um, oh yeah, there we go. Um, let's see if there's a difference in what we get. Uh, if we do, I think it's exactly the same thing, but it's also a very basic record. Yeah, it's exactly the same. This is the non sego version. Yeah, and as you can see, it just does uh, a bunch of Oh, it opens and then just reads the file directly. Um, so let's see, is there a way that we could get a test environment where uh, we would have some additional information that is only exposed by the NSS thing? Probably not super trivial to set this up quickly, um, but probably doable. I wonder if it would make sense to try and run the program in such a way that it wouldn't have access to Etsy password. At the same time, restricting access to Etsy password seems like a really bad idea, you know, just in general for having a working system. <laughs> Hmm. So let's see. Yeah, and the switch is sort of even more obscure than PAM in this way, because PAM is something that you often have to fiddle with and NS switch less often. So that's also, I think, why there's more information available and more like, you know, dummy modules and stuff like that, tutorials for PAM as compared to NS switch. Okay, so I think I think we're not going to actually be able to, to verify that there's any differences, but I think one thing that we can do um, is we can change our uh, local installation of Go and to have a standard library implementation where the Seago version is no longer in there, um, and instead it would always use our code to do any sort of lookups that it can't do while Seago is disabled. Uh, so let me see where we are. Okay, so we are already we are already in a writable copy of the standard library here. Look up Unix. Change Etsy password to dev null in the compiler. I mean, I guess we can just do this. Um, wait, why did it not? Why did it not rebuild though? 
I would have expected it to rebuild. Oh, um, no, this should be, should be the setup. Huh. Maybe use namespaces to limit access to slash Etsy. Yeah, um, if you have an easy way to do that, I'm all ears. Okay, um, so we have user file. Oh, interesting. Now this should be the right place. Okay, so I thought it should it should find this, but maybe maybe we need to just rebuild it. It's slightly suspicious that there is a different version in the output here. Okay. Wait, it doesn't actually read Etsy password. So where does it get its info from? Oh, could it be that I'm not using enough of the user package actually? Look up Unix UID. Look up Unix UID. Oh, but I think I would need lookup Unix from current. Oh, that might explain it. Lookup stubs, yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. This is what we're running into. Uh, lookup user ID. Okay, so I think current UID. Yeah, let's just get UID. And then this lookup user, where's that going? Aha, uh -huh. so this is where, huh, but this is called. Interesting. I mean, did I read this wrong? But, aha, uh -huh. so, yeah, okay, uh, it's doing get UID and then it's trying to open def null. So, oh, uh, okay, okay, so it is actually now no longer reading Etsy password, but, it is still getting enough info. Oh yeah, because, aha, right. So this is optional, this is an optional code path. Uh, prefer the latter if we can get it. So Etsy password is only preferred if it exists. And otherwise, 
you still get a record, but it just fills in as much info as it can possibly deduce uh, without having the full info available. So I think if we pay close attention, oh, actually, um, let me uh, let me verify real quick. Okay, um, where are we here? All right, so, yeah. Okay, so what I have changed now is in my Etsy password, I have added a full name for the stream user that I'm working as. It's now called stream blank user, uh, capital S, capital U. And if we do sego enabled equals zero, you can see that the name field is no longer filled in. Um, so now we know which code path it's actually going into. Um, and that will be in here. Okay, um, so what we can do now is um, we could say if the error is nil, oh, if the error is not nil, try systemd based, systemd user dbd lookup. Um, this is a place where we could do it. Now, what do we actually want though? Uh, lookup user ID. Okay, so these are the stub functions that we have. We have lookup group. Oh, yeah, okay, maybe we should just start with the user file and group file. So we have lookup user, lookup user ID, and lookup group, and lookup group ID. All of these open a file. Uh, in the first two cases, it's Etsy group. In the other two cases, it's Etsy password. So these seem to be the four entry points that we have. And then find group name. Aha. Uh -huh. Right. So these all operate on an on an op on an open file, which is made available here through the reader interface. So these can only read. Um, but they require a reader. Okay, cool. Yeah, this seems this seems straightforward enough. Um, so this is lookup Unix. We should probably make it a uh, lookup Linux, seeing as systemd user dbd is specific to Linux. But we can do this afterwards um, before we try to actually get it upstream. Um, and for just trying it out, it's quicker to just not bother. Um, so let's see. Um, so what we want here, find group ID. Okay, what does this do? Match group index value, find group name, match group index value. There's, aha. So this is value and then the field index, but it's essentially just looking at a record formatted like this. So we have zero, one and two, and zero is the group name and two is the group ID. Um, so that's what this does, ID, and this one here is name. So it seems to me, let's go back to these. So these return a group, which is a group ID and a name. And then the other is probably return a user, which is UID, group ID, username, name, and home there. Okay. So, okay, so I suppose uh, the next step is to actually change our proof of concept code. Um, so that instead of getting the user record, do we want the user record? I mean, I suppose we could, but I am curious what happens um, if, you know, as the, as the documentation suggests, we do the NSS, the, no, where was it? Compatibility with NSS, IO system the name service switch service. Right. Uh, so yeah, let's see what happens here. This should be commented, this should be uncommented. Right. Um, oh, oh, because it's, okay, I see. 
the socket is a symlink, so <laughs> we can use either name at that level, but then we're still calling the old method. But actually, is there is there an interface definition for this? Oh yeah. No. Who knows? Let's see. Is it somewhere else? Okay, I mean, I guess we can always browse the code, but let's see if there's something more targeted. Hmm, maybe no. Okay, browsing the code it is. Um, though, Um, that'll be much more convenient. Oh, no, this is not what I wanted. D246. Sure. All right. And now, um, So, userdb.c, userdbd manager. Wouldn't it be weird if the multiplexer doesn't forward requests to the NSS version if enabled? Yeah, I think so. I think it should. Um, I mean, I yeah, I think I, I could probably change back. Oh, wait. Change back to use the multiplexer on the dial level. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I don't know. Um, let's first figure out the, the the correct method and interface, et cetera, and then let's think about in a separate step where we want to connect to. I think it's kind of nice that we specify in our connection attempt which service we want to reach. But yeah, I mean, strictly speaking, it should also always work via the multiplexer. So I don't know if that's actually going to tell us anything ever. Let's see what this does. Start one worker. Okay, I don't think that's it. 464. Avoid NNS, NSS. Hmm. What does this do? Oh, let's talk to the multiplexer if we can. Interesting. So they, oh, this is user DB query. Nice. Okay. So this is how they query it. That should be instructive. So there is an avoid multiplexer. Um, but it seems like you're right in that the multiplexer should probably be our first choice. And then what do they do? Um, multiplexer, otherwise dynamic user. Avoid NS, NSS if requested, fair enough. And then they have user DB connect. Okay, just a bunch of barling plumbing. But then where do they do an actual query? Uh, maybe in here. This is add NS, NSS service. Then this is get user record. Okay. Oh, so it might actually have the same interface then. Because it also returns the same errors. Um, it might just be that it's a special service name, maybe? Oh, and in here is probably the place where I should specify this. Yeah, I guess. Stream user, yeah. Wait, this is not correct. Oh no, it is correct. Um, I read it wrong. 
and I think I read it wrong because it is formatted misleadingly. Okay, uh, stream user, this is all we get. We currently don't decode it all. Happy programmer's day. Is it programmer's day? Is that even a thing? Huh, it is. Nice, yeah, thanks for the hint. Happy programmer's day, everyone. It was totally intentional to stream today. Oh, it's every 256th day of the year. Nice. In leap year, it's only the 12th of September. Is it a leap year? 2020 is a leap year? It's 2020 a leap year. What? Yes, it is. This knowledge panel doesn't make any sense. <laughs> oh, it's telling me when 2020 starts and ends. Wow, <laughs> this is really bad. Okay, um, yeah, thanks, <laughs> great. All right, uh, so back to the topic. Um, this is what we get from the API. Um, one thing that we could do here, oh, this is wrong. Because I'm not sure if you've all seen it. Um, <laughs> Years start on January 1st and they end on December 31st. Technically correct, the best kind of correct. Um, have you seen JQ, the JSON query? Um, it's a pretty nifty tool to turn this ugly text line of JSON into a nice looking colored indented record of JSON. You can also query it using the tool, but the query that I'm specifying is just dot, which just means give me the contents of the JSON that I put in. Um, so now we can actually see what's happening here, right? So we have actually gotten a reply from the name service switch service, which is great. Um, and we have all of the fields that we care about, I hope. Let's see, status we don't care about, the others we do care about. And I think if we go to look up Unix into the user record, why don't we do a quick side-by-side? -side? So um, the UID, we have it here. The group ID, we have it here. Username, we have it here. Name, that's the real name. And home there, we have all of these. We even have the shell, which is not part here. Um, great. So first up, we'll need to add all of the fields that we care about. So that would be all of these. We already have username. We need real name. Um, all of these need to be uh, exported. So uppercase here, uh, which is why we need to tell Go that in JSON, it should be lowercase first. UID and group ID off by one is by choice. Um, it might be by accident. I don't know. Um, not the right place and time to find out, but as long as it works, uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see, what are the types that we have here? Uh, UID, oh, that's actually a string. All right, because on Windows, it's a security identifier. Huh, it's very stringly typed. But in JSON here, it's actually not even a string. Okay, we need to convert this anyway then. Um, we can just say int. Yeah, this is this is very Linux only. And then group ID, also an int for now. Oh yeah, because they're like, I think, well, better be sure. Um, in home directory. Cool. So, um, presumably we need the same thing for groups also. So let's copy this, adjust it for groups, and then deduplicate, and then see if we can push this into the standard library somehow. Mm. There is get user record and get group record. Oh, and all of these can also filter 
which might actually be nice. Um, depending on how we call them. We'll see later. Okay. It's also really a small interface, which I like. So get group record. Okay. Let's just do this. Query user DB, query user DB. Let's say query group DB. Unrelated i3 question. Is there any reason for stacking instead of tabby windows, considering that the latter gives you more vertical screen space? I like seeing full window titles. Um, in this case, they're not super long, but um, typically they're longer, and I don't like them being cut up so early. But it's a matter of preference. All right, um, get user record, get group record. And then in the groups, well, I think it'll tell us the text. Yeah, perfect. So we can use JQ again to visualize it. We have group name and GID. Fair enough. Root name, root name, GID, no home directory. Group name. This didn't work. Why did it not work? Oh, I'm modifying the wrong code. Yep. Yep. All right. Group name, group name, GID. All right. Yep, perfect. So yeah, um, let's see what we can do here. Um, the method was different, and then the result type was different. And, uh, all right. Um, we need to parse each of these individually because there's the reply.continues, which indicates whether we should read more records or not. Um, so we definitely need to either buffer all of these in memory, which is probably fine, um, and or decode them. We should probably, hmm, how should we do this? I mean, what we could do is just specify a callback Yeah, that might be that might be easiest. So let's try to factor this out um, with a callback approach. Okay, so Or actually, we could just say this should just be of type user.group. And then just gonna say, just gonna construct that record right here, right there. Um, I want name to be reply parameters record group name 
this is way too long of a name, so shorten it. Um, this format int, I guess. Here, I'm not entirely sure if we just return. Let me see. Look up Unix. Oh, an individual. Oh, yeah, we need to. Oh, right. This needs to be filtered in all of the cases anyway. Fair enough. And it only returns one record. Well, that is that's not bad for us actually. So we just need to add the filter here. Now, this should be query user dbd method should be passed in, and our marshal is a func from byte to error that we largely just call for its side effects. Um, this is method. All of them go to the name service switch service. Should we prefer IO system multiplexer? Unclear. Currently. Um, and then here, this is where we say unmarshal sc.bytes. Um, okay. There we go. So now this should be usable for both uh, query user db. Just gonna define that in terms of the other one as well. And this would be method. Okay. Need this type definition here. Remove this. Say user. 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 Var user. 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 Jesus Christ! So many users. Uh, okay. Cool. Format int, format u int. Oh, because we need a base. There, there. Too many arguments to return. Oh, right. This would be user group. Um. Oh, right. I should probably. You know, Bit unfulfilling, but that's that's what it is. And to return the um, reply dot continue from each iteration of a marshal. So um, reply continues. User undefined. That's almost good. Um, right. So now, which fields do we have? UID, username, home there. Wait, did I write it wrong? I did. 
username. Okay, so this is r.uid base temp. Username is r.username, r.home directory. I mean, there's more. UID, group ID. Username, name, and home dear. Username, name, and home dear. Okay. Didn't write it wrong after all. Too many arguments to return. This should be user to user. Not enough arguments to return. And then ignore the returned user and group. Okay. <laughs> Okay, cool. So this just gives us the last record now. Uh, the last one that we received. Um, this is smoke pain, but that's not what we want. Um, I think... I mean, essentially, we need to further parameterize this. So we have a different filter function. Um, depending on what we what we specify here, um, and I think right, what this does is it calls current UID. Oh, and then it does I two A. Oh, I should probably also use I two A. Oh, but that's only for type int, not for type int sixty four. That's why. All right. But what I want to do is um, get the ID. So we're just going to do a username for now, and then we're going to extend this. So if r.username not equals Let's say filter username. So we can distinguish these. Uh, we're gonna just actually return reply to continues. No. And that's how we skip. Oh. Um, so now we no longer get anything. Nice. So why? Oh, because this is username and not filter user, filter UID, why not filter UID? UID, right, and of course, we need to compare the streamified version. Nice, okay, so now we get um, the UID and group ID as we expected, but this time from systemd, so that's nice. And, um, now we need the same thing, but for the user name. You can kind of see how this is starting to uh, take the shape of a test, but um, I don't want to start the test too early. Um, I think it's going to be, it, it might be wasted work if we start it now, um, if we're going to integrate this into the standard library afterwards, because it might have its own constraints on how the test might need to look. So user db username and that would just be stream query user oh wait query right, user db right filter username stream user all right, so now these can become the same thing just with a filter predicate that we can pass in. So 
So this would be, right, the predicate now needs type info. So now we probably need to go from our anonymous types to actually named types. So this would be a user record. Type user record struct. Um, and the predicate would be a func that gets a user record and returns bool. In this case, the predicate would be can write both at the same time. User record and pool. It's this one. Um, this would be r dot real name, no, username is not filter username. And this is the predicate. If the predicate will be the positive match. So this would be the filter that we're looking for. Positives are generally easier to phrase for humans. So if nothing else, use the positive because it's easier to understand. And then this one here will be return UID equals filter UID. Perfect. Can't even do it like this. It's a handy one-liner. Okay. Um, this will be query user db either of the two, but it will get a predicate function passed in, and it will return a user user error. So this can be defined as just like this one. Don't even need to name the predicate actually, but if not predicate r skip. Okay. It should be u.username, u.uid. Cannot use r, type user record as type user record pointer. Wait, what did I say? Oh, we don't, oh yeah, that's fine. And then uid, oh, because we can no longer reuse this, but no biggie. Okay, cool. So now we get, uh, now we have filtering working by user ID and by username. Can inline these predicates. All right. Um, and now essentially we need to restructure the uh, query for groups in much the same way. So this would be type group record struct. Um, and we would also define two functions. That'll be the interface that just have the predicate. But this time, the filter group name and filter group ID. And it will also be group record, not user record. Here we should say g dot group name equals filter group name, and then here this should say g dot gid equals filter gid. Good. Now I don't think the names are the best yet. I'm probably going to give them an overhaul later before I actually suggest this for code review. Group record pool predicate skip it filtered. So uh, let's do it exactly like here. Predicate R, yep, that is correct. 
cannot use user dot group. Right. Return argument. Oh, because I oh right. This is where I need to change it. Okay, right, and then it doesn't know which variant, of course. Uh, group TB username stream. Yeah, nice. Yeah, thanks for the hint. Um, group ID OS dot get git. I2A oh, query group or just ID. Oh. What's happening here? So this is an interesting failure case. Um, Is it trying to read too much, maybe? The git function name is wrong. The git function name is wrong? What do you mean? Guess not. Dumb question. Since the golib function only are concerned with a single element, you can query the system to API with a specific user ID group, but do really need predicates beyond checking whether they return a result or not. Um, I don't know if it's guaranteed that filtering is always available and always returns precisely one record. Um, I guess if so, it would be a little bit simpler. Um, but yeah, I just don't know yet. Let's just make this G1, G2. Okay, so G1 is quired, oddly enough. And then group DB username, that's a silly name. Is that what you meant? <laughs> group DB group name. Wait, it returned eventually, I think. Or was that because I restarted? I don't know. Group DB group name, let's see. Group to be. Oh yeah, no, it just, what? It just took forever. Do you see that? It took 15 seconds between G1 and G2. Why? Let us add some debug log. Mm. I wonder if the problem is um, I wonder if the problem is related to um, at which position in the results we're getting our match like you know if if by accident we always took the last record, that would mean that maybe if we break too early, um, maybe it can't flush the response out or something and then it runs into a timeout. I don't know. Or maybe we don't send our query correctly. Um, so this would be one of the cases where actually if we just did, um, we do sega enabled equals zero, just do s trace, um, don't slash OS user. We don't even need to for this to, to finish, I think. Well, maybe we do. We'll see. So, what are we doing here? We see the connect. 
Oh, we do a new, um, oh, do we do that? Do we do a new connection for every query? I think we do. So it doesn't, it shouldn't matter if we drained the other one correctly or not. Though we should probably, I don't see any close calls here. So I wonder if we don't have the close in here. Yep. Maybe that's related. Oh yeah, that looks better. Yeah, there we go. All right, clean up your resources. I'm not sure why this failure symptom, but hey, um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go down the rabbit hole and look at system decode right now, um, or S trace for that matter. Okay, um, so I think this is our proof of concept, right? Um, we can we can get um, group names and users. Um, I mean, we can get group records and user records both by user ID and by username and by group ID and by group name. And that's, I think, all that we need, right? Because the lookup stubs, um, it has a current, huh, or rather the lookup Unix. So yeah, I guess this is interesting. So. I think the next step could really be that um, we change this and we change it in such a way that we just say, we're just gonna comment it out entirely, right? Okay, so now immediately we get an error message. Um, and now we know which functions we need to implement, right? And um, we have lookup user, lookup user ID, lookup group, lookup group ID. Um, so hey, why not, why not give it a shot? This is just gonna put all of this over here. This is terrible. Don't do this at home. Uh, and then, all right. Now that we are in that package, we no longer need the package name. Um, cool. So, look at Unix. And now we can already, before we add more functions that wrap other functions, let's just change these to fulfill the, um, the API that we want. Lookup user. That should be this. Then lookup user ID should be that. Okay, lookup group. Should be here. And lookup group ID. is here. Okay, fair enough, but this is now still using our code directly. So let's change this back in. I think this is looking good. Um, yeah. Perfect. Um, this is connecting to systemd and getting all of our data that we need. Um, so yeah, maybe it is as simple as that. Neat, yeah, nice, right? I love it when a plan works out. And by plan, I mean no plan at all, uh, just prototyping. Um, okay, so now the big question, we're at two hours and 30. Um, I'm wondering if I should give it a go to actually try and plug this into the standard library, like at least a little closer to code review quality, um, or if I should call it early and then we'll do something else from scratch um, some other time. Um, what do people think? Is anyone like super interested to see like 
how this would fit into a standard library. Go for it, I'm enjoying it. Okay, cool. Um, we're gonna do a little more, um, but no longer than I think half an hour or so. Um, so let's see how far we come in half an hour. Um, if you have any questions, now would be a great time. Um, otherwise, Cool, so, all right. Um, one habit that I have is that whenever I deal with um, upstream repositories that are sort of non-trivial, um, I try to, and that are also you know, in, important in my system, I do a, an entirely separate checkout. Um, I like to call this one upstream go because it's, you know, tracking upstream Go um, and not necessarily the Go version that I have on my system. Um, and then, you know, if anything goes wrong in here, um, I, I can I can deal with this directory entirely independently from a typical Go installation. And this is very nice in Go actually, because um, in Go it's all nicely self-contained and it's very it's simple to actually compile it. So, you know, I just go into source, I say make that bash, uh, you can see it's doing the compilation. It's doing actually a three-stage bootstrap uh, process here, which is you know, quite advanced, but it doesn't take so long. So it's nice and simple to do this. And then um, now we have a Git checkout. Previously, we only had a directory. Um, thanks for showing upstream stuff to go. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, we'll see how far we go. Um, I don't think I don't think I want to like log into Garrett and all that sort of weird shit. Um, <laughs> you know, if only they use GitHub pull requests. But um, I know that I can like create a pull request and then it will do a Garrett for me, but then it's gonna be under the wrong username, I think. I'm gonna do the Garrett just, you know, when I'm in the proper setup for it and not on stream. Okay, um, so now that we have this, um, let's actually, how are we gonna do this? Um, yeah, let's just open it up. Upstream go source uh, OS user lookup Unix. Okay, so now we need to think a little bit, right? Um, we have these various lookup files here. We have lookup stubs, Unix, Unix test, Windows, Plan 9, and Android, and lookup.go without any build tags. Um, so lookup Android is build tech guarded to plus build Android. Lookup plan nine is build tech guarded by its file name. I mean, already that is inconsistent. Um, then we have stubs, which is built. Yeah, and see it now, <laughs> now is the time um, where, was it like this? Oh, there we go. Um, Maybe we find this quickest if we click media. If we can click media. Oh my God, really? Twitter, really? Okay, wait. Um, there was a recent build tag proposal. There we go. And I think the design document here actually has like a bunch of good examples because the whole point of this proposal or design or whatever you want to call it is that um, it acknowledges that the current syntax is just not understandable and it unifies it into a well understandable syntax. So, you know, <laughs> given that we need to deal with the current syntax, uh, I figure it's good to just pull this up for context so that everybody understands what we're doing, including myself, because I can never remember the current syntax. Um, and then you know, eventually this will be changed to be more readable. Okay, so this is all motivation, let's see. Okay, so this is old syntax, this is new syntax. So already we can see these directives are ended. Um, and I think they're ORed in between them. So, and I think it says so as well. We have arrived, blah, blah, expressing ends of wars, <laughs> of ends of potential nodes. Oh my God, yes. Yes, exactly. Um, where does it say? Oh yeah, each line lists, listed a set of ORD conditions. Multiple lines were in effect ANDed together. 
Uh, so let's see what we have to deal with here. So these are ORD conditions. So we have, we are in stub. So if it's neither Seago nor Windows nor Plan 9, or if it's Android, wow, what, really? Um, or OS user Go and not Windows and not Plan 9, then we're here. Yeah, this is this is pretty, pretty terrible. Um, and this one here, it mentions Linux here as an or, so this will be used for Linux if it's not Android. Oh, okay. And then what we could do presumably is we could add a lookup Linux.go and say, this one should only be used, well, this one would actually, I think this is what we would need to do, right? Sounds like a pretty printer would be helpful, haha. <laughs> yes, um, in fact, let me see. Uh, does it have a table of contents? No, it does not. So, transition, right? Um, the transition strategy is pretty interesting for this. Um, and this one is a relevant one. If a file contains only build plus build lines, GoFilmed will add the equivalent Go build line above them. So there is actually a pretty printer, um, starting with the version when the transition will start. Um, <clears throat> and the way you, you work with these, and Russ actually shows it in the video, is uh, you know given that you have a new enough version of Go, you just resave your file, and then you look at the new version, right? And then you can change it and it will be kept up to date, et cetera, et cetera. So in effect, yeah, uh, it will be machine interpreted um, and explained, so to say, by virtue of switching to the new syntax. Um, but we don't have that available right now handy, so yeah. Okay, cool. So now it says look up undefined these four functions that we need to define. That is exactly what we wanted. We're gonna say look up linux.go, and say package user, copy the copyright blurb, and then in the lookup unix.go where we just copied our code into earlier, just gonna copy and paste all of that out, copy it in here, uh, see if that fixes compilation, it does. Huh? Yeah, that was simple indeed. Um, Are you Muslim? No, um, I'm not religious at all. So let's see. Um, I think stops. Um, current. Let's see where we call lookup user ID OS user. We define it a bunch. And we call it from stubs and we call it from lookup.go. Right, because here it's a help function. Oh, and here it's exposed. Oh, right. Um, okay. I mean, I think at this point we should be, so this now is using upstream go as a go root. We should be in a position to actually run the tests, see what's happening. Oh, right, what I wanted to add um, is uh, a proper fallback mechanism, right? Because thus far, um, we have now entirely replaced the existing Unix implementation. And actually, it would be better if we did not just the systemd1, but then actually fall back to the Unix one. So we actually need both in effect, um, which is what's going to complicate further the structure of build tags and files. Um, so do I want to fix that first? Or do you want to fix the tests first? Hmm. 
let's see what what's this saying um oh this probably all right um if you have sego enabled and this should probably be reproducible in here yeah then we still have the redefinitions because we do not currently We do not currently have any build tags. We need at least not Seago. And we probably, hmm. Okay. All right, so we would want Either this or this, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, it passes the test, but I mean, we haven't added any tests, right? So clearly there is not sufficient coverage yet. Um, but also I think more pressing is how are we gonna architect the fallback? Because we do need this implementation here and we currently have just removed it entirely. So I think we'll need an additional layer of indirection here where um, essentially for this file, we move the implementation out to a separate file that was always linked in. And then uh, we just have the stubs in here, like the, um, where are they? Lookup group ID, lookup user, et cetera. And these should just call out to the um, generic Unix implementation and so should the Linux one as a fallback. Um, but then also, let's have a look at the tests here. So we have, oh, we have individual tests actually. So that might also be why. Wow, that's a lot. Um, that might be why the tests are passing. Oh, and also this one, we have changed lookup Unix earlier and we haven't made the corresponding change here. Okay. So I suppose this is where we would have, um, this is where we would add a test that exercises the whole like a Varling protocol, um, probably with captured golden values, um, presumably, you know, why not out of S trace? Um, well, we could also, instead of getting them out of S trace because they're only zero terminated, um, it's easy enough to construct them by hand, right? So you could just you know, have a, a, a JSON literal as a constant backslash zero and then another JSON literal. So that should be, that should be simple enough. Um, why don't we have a look at this? And then um, as a later step, the fallback, let me, let me just make to do here. Fallback to generic Unix implementation. Probably need another layer of indirection. And what we want is a lookup Linux test.go. Okay. And then essentially, these build tag things quickly get messy, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, the the Linux one, you know, actually a more pragmatic solution might be instead of doing like the extra files and all of the build tag changes to just change the uh, lookup Unix one and accept that we have more code in there um, because it can fail at runtime, right? And we need to deal with it failing at runtime anyway. So maybe the, the first one, the quick and dirty solution where it just put everything into lookup Unix is a way forward after all. Um, I think I might actually change it back to that model uh, before I send the pull request and see what people think, um, if they think we should use build tags to split this out more, um, or if the couple of lines you know, of, of you know, dealing with Unix sockets and JSON, et cetera, on which there's already plenty of dependencies all over the standard library, um, well, that might be an exaggeration, but there might be, there, there should be enough uh, dependencies that this is not a big deal. 
in terms of code size. Um, yeah, that you know that might just be the best way forward. Okay, so um, but let's at least get started on a test here, um, so that you know you have a better idea of how it would look like, even though it might not we might not finish it today. So test query user DVD. What we'll need to do is we'll need to be the server side. So we'll need to be the net.listen Unix on a path that we'll need to manage. Then um, we'll need to read a backslash zero terminated message from the client. And we'll need to reply with a backslash zero terminated message. Well, with one to n, last message has um, continues equals false. Yeah, and essentially that is it. And you know, because the protocol is so simple, and we only have these uh, one to one interactions, like you know, every query is one new connection and one new query. Um, there is only one query per connection, so we can't even get away with just saying, "Okay, I'm just going to read until I have one full line uh, that is back to zero terminated," and then just send out a couple of lines without even um, interpreting what we've read, what we've read actually. Right? That might just work. Um, so let's create a temp there. Iutil dot temp there. Uh, test query user DVD for identification. If there is an error, we abort the test and we do clean this up afterwards. So the temporary directory is required so we can actually have a location in which we can be sure that we can create a Unix socket, um, which doesn't necessarily require a file system entry, but uh, is more portable, I think, to have a file system entry. Anyway, um, that's what we're gonna do to start with anyway. So temp there. Unix.sock, or maybe just sock. And then we're going to close this listener. This doesn't really matter, but it's nice to do. Um, so then, so here already we are at a little bit of a conundrum, right? Because we have this custom split function that a buffio.new scanner can use so that it can return backslash zero terminated messages. Now we could just say, well, we're just going to use that same split function on you know both of the implementations, but then if we have a subtle mistake in this split function, we might not catch it because you know if we're using the same function with the same bug in, in both of the implementations, why would they ever interface with each other? So maybe it is actually better. Um, to read in a different way, um, to you know, until until we get the backslash zero. Um, one thing that I could imagine is that the queries are typically so small that it might just be enough to just do one read. Um, and then see how much we got. Which should be fine. Like as long as it fits into like a 4K page, it will not be split, not on any operating system. Um, so, you know, maybe this is like the, the quickest and dirtiest iteration that we can do here. So let's say we do a byte buffer, 4K page size minimum, and we just say, oh, right. Um, well, first of all, um, what we'll need to do is actually serve connections here. And we're gonna wanna do that in the background. So we're gonna put this into a separate go routine. Um, cool. Serve user DVD on net.con sure 
plug some error reporting into here. Um, let's use log.print for now. Turn nil, we're gonna say com.read into buff. We're gonna get either an error or and we're gonna get how much we have read. Um, and I think n can be, can be zero ever? Yeah, I think it can be zero. But if the error is nil, it must either be zero or positive, I think. But yeah, so I think um, we can now cap the buffer to n. Okay, and um, by virtue of closing the listener here, actually, I think this guardian should error out of accept and then actually should just return here. Maybe log the error. There's no need to influence the test behavior also because this guardian might actually outlive the test um, unless we add synchronization. Um, yeah, and then in the in the handle we can totally reply that would go here, and then in here we need to do the actual test driving, right? So here is where we would do something like uh, lookup group stream. And now we do a different value here that we don't have on my system. Um, so that we can be sure that we're gonna use the, the test implementation, right? And one thing that we'll need to pass in now is, or that we need to divert somehow, um, is the location of the Unix socket. Again, quick and dirty thing here to start with it could be something like an overridable variable only within the package though, not exported. Um, and that would be, let's see, do we have, oh, come on. Address, uh, user DVD address, and I'm just gonna set this to the address here. The user DVD address. Um, all right. Channel needs a keyboard ASMR tech for sure. If only that existed, I don't think even a Go tag exists. Okay, so this is this is obviously not great, right? Um, encapsulate parameters into state struct and modify it there for testing. Um, but I'm not going to do that today, seeing as we near the three R mark. But let's see. Um, let's see what this test does, or if it does anything, really. User DVD address undefined. User DVD address. Ooh. Why does it say that? Um, did I spell it wrong? No, it, I don't, I don't think I did. Oh, did I? No, it's the, it's the correct file. Are the build tags a problem again, maybe? Is it because I would need to use Sego enabled zero? Yeah. Ha, huh, build tags. And then t.logf. All right. Uh, this is the one we want. Oh my God, what? Aha, uh -huh, right. I think it takes a little while because it needs to recompile parts of the standard library and 
you know, that might add up. Or it hangs, <laughs> more likely actually. Um, one thing we can do is kill dashboard and we get a goroutine trace. And then we say, aha, uh -huh, this is where we hang. So we do lookup group, query group DB, query user DBD, and then we hang in scan, which, you know, that totally makes sense now, right? Because uh, we have the red line. This is what we get. This is the query that we get, right? So our our assumption here actually totally holds, right? The, the read call that we did here with the 4K page size buffer was indeed large enough to get the full uh, new line terminated message. We should add an assertion here so that it breaks really early if it hold, if it turns out that the assumption that I'm making here doesn't hold in any of, for example, the test environments that we have, like on any of the test builders, um, you know, or if I'm just wrong or if it changes over time, who knows. But um, what we want to do here is if bytes dot has suffix buff backslash zero, we're going to say invalid message not backslash zero terminated. Okay, this doesn't work because do I need to cast it? Right. Um, was it this? I always forget. It looks like maybe, maybe no, no. Um, Let's see if we can Google this. <laughs> Is there like, yeah, no, Wikipedia is no good for this. <laughs> um, sometimes there's like these um, comparisons, how different pieces of code that are familiar look in different programming languages. Um, one thing that we can do is uh, do a Debian code search, and see if uh, bytes that has suffix dot slash as a regular expression, please. No dice. Um, I suppose, oh, because has suffix actually, oh, I think I might have confused it with, do we have a has suffix byte? We do not. Oh, okay, that explains why I was unable to, because I was I was attempting to use the wrong syntax. Okay. Um, and then I think, yeah, that is, no, this is still not it. What? Wait, is it complaining about the other line, 23? No, it's complaining about this line. Oh, I think we can just do this. And now it's complaining about the other line. There we go. Okay, um, so, but it's still hanging, which is fine. Uh, there we go. Now we see the output in real time. Um, right, so now we read the line. We have verified our assumption that is backslash zero terminated. Um, we should probably also inspect the query verify it matches expectations but I'm a little bit pressed on time right now so what we're just gonna do is we're just gonna do a write um and I think we should still have these here so what are we doing we are testing lookup group which is good because it's the um shorter of the of the two but this is literal here and I think 
write returns how many bytes it actually wrote. All right, and then here, This is how I do it here. Um, ah. I think this might be the quickest way of zero terminating it. Hey, look. Um, now it's saying nil because what we're giving it back is the smoke ping group. And what's asking for is the standard lib contrib group. So presumably if we did this, ta-da, we get the standard lib contrib. Nice, okay, so this is like the most minimal test that I can imagine for this particular protocol. Um, you know, just read write of known working strings that you get as reply or um, as a request. But obviously there is more to it um, and this, you know, this will not be accepted as is. Um, but I think I think we're going to cut it here for today. Um, if you still have, you know, if you have any questions, now is your last chance to ask them. Um, otherwise, of course, you can always reach out um, on Twitter or wherever. But um, if there's any questions about anything you've seen here today, then now's the time. Cool. I'm going to do like a work in progress comment. Um, look at Linux slash look at Linux systemd uh, user dbd. Glad it was interesting. Uh, and thanks for joining. Um, all right. I think. This is where I'm gonna end things for today and then uh, probably push this somewhere so that people can take a look at it if they're so inclined and update the issue so that people don't spend duplicate effort on this. But um, otherwise I'm gonna you know, take care of the rest of the submission off stream. Um, cool, so to recap, um, we have changed two things, actually three. Um, we have made router seven TCP compatible for DNS, um, we have improved its reliability for DHCP version 4. When you change the IP address, we have um, started the integration of health checking and DHCP starting from scratch. Um, these are solid reliability improvements. And then um, afterwards, we started out working on a user and group record lookup in non sego environments based on systemd for you know, a, a medium term or long term future where that will actually be available on more Linux distributions and then Go should be ready and leverage it if it's available, I think. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Um, it was fun having you here. Um, and please be sure to subscribe both on Twitch um, and Twitter if you wanna be notified of upcoming streams. Cool, thanks and have a great day.